Hello, and welcome to Need to Know, your weekly investment podcast brought to you by the experts at Coots. I'm Sarah Muir, and I'm joined as always by Alan Higgins. Each week on the podcast, we look at the three things investors need to know. Now, that might be for the week ahead, but we also look at longer term trends and re- we read, sorry, we read some of the research so that you don't have to. But before we get to this week's Need to Know, Alan, um, a few little bits to sort of catch up on from recent episodes. Now, one thing, Howard was on last week talking about US earnings and he told us a brilliant story, but we'd finished recording and it was like, oh, Howard, why didn't you mention that during the podcast? He, he, talk, he talk, We were talking about momentum trading, weren't we? And he talked about NVIDIA, which, of course, you know, everybody's crazy about NVIDIA at the moment. But can you relay the story that he told and, and what that tells us perhaps about kind of investor behaviour or investor psychology and, and this kind of attitudes to momentum trading? Yeah. So um, stepping back a bit, I think it's it's a great point. We mentioned last time that very few investors in equity investing, stop picking it at least, use momentum formally and mathematically as a signal. Howard does. I did have a a few people get come on to me to remind uh, me that there's a huge industry called CTAs that explicitly use momentum. But that's more on asset classes. Mm bonds, equities, et cetera, uh, commodities especially. But going to Howard's point, yeah, it's very interesting because uh, he knows a lot of semiconductor analysts and video analysts, if you like, and and others. And um, one of the analysts basically said, you know, I go to see so many investors and the most common question is after I've done my presentation and said, yes, you've got to buy NVIDIA. And they say, mm, yeah, thank you very much. But um, given it's performed so strongly, can you can you please uh, give me something that is like Nvidia but is not Nvidia, which <laughs> helps explain why maybe momentum works because there's a big swathe of investors out there that refuse to endorse it, and Howard's yeah. quite right; it does work. To be fair, there are other quant firms that do, do use momentum in uh, individual stocks, but I think it's it's rare in a classic stock picking environment, active mm. stock picking environment. Is it because you don't look very smart if you trade momentum? Is that the issue? Like you've got to look, if you're advising someone, if you're a fund manager, you've got to look like I'm really clever. I can pick these stocks that nobody else has spotted. And if you're just buying NVIDIA and Apple and Berkshire Hathaway, it's like, well, yeah, any idiot can do that. Is that, is that, the, is that the sort of the, the prejudice against momentum trading? I, I think you're spot on. I'll give you a, a couple of examples. I'll go back way back in my career. So uh, about it as well. But I think one way of thinking about it, if I said to you, um, if I had this job, I don't have this job, uh, you know, Howard's job, if you like, if I said to you, yeah, we're buying NVIDIA now. Surely, Sarah, naturally, aren't you going to be thinking, aren't you a bit late? You know, exactly. So, so there you go. So that's human. And secondly, I'll give you an example. Admittedly, it was a very, very long time ago. I won't say which firm I was working for. But when a paper first came out, from the CFA and the Financial Analyst Journal about momentum in currencies and showing that it worked. So this is currencies now. And Mm. basically, it was really simple in those days. It was 1980s. And basically, if a currency moved through the 10-day moving average and then the 50-day moving average, you bought and then you bought some more. And I always remember the CIO said, who's a very, very smart guy, and I get it. He said, that's the stupidest piece of research I've ever seen. And it always struck me, and I thought, yeah, on the face of it, it is. But it works. Yeah. And that's why <laughs> our friends in the CTA community, and I know you do listen in, have had such a prosperous time because um, trend following, yeah. as it's called, does work. Okay. But it, it, it's yeah, an interesting point to say. So, okay, well, I'm sure we're going to come back to this again. But um, that was that was, that was was a good story. I like that one. And then also... Um, you had a client get in touch with you because we mentioned last week, we talked about after the passing of Byron Ween and his annual kind of event that everybody looked forward to, which is where he announced his three surprises for the following year. You, I think I think there's a little bit of uh, an appetite to hear your three surprises. So we're going to give you a bit of time to work on that, aren't we? And you're going to come up with your three surprises for 2024. Yes, and we'll do this in great humility because Byron truly was a, a great man for those who haven't listened to yeah. me previous podcast I worked with him uh, briefly at Morgan Stanley and yeah the ethos is it's 
it's very easy to come up with surprises. But what his genius mm. was that coming up with surprises that seem somewhat outlandish, but have a higher probability than working out than general perceptions. So we'll have a go. We'll have a go at three. And maybe we'll get some other colleagues at Coots to have a go at three as well. Yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll do that with great humility. But I think we'll do it more like in December would be the intuition for doing that. Traditional time yeah. for next year forecasts. Yeah, absolutely. And then the only other thing which we didn't talk about last week, but we've mentioned already Berkshire Hathaway. I was kind of curious to get your thoughts on the fact that they're holding huge amounts of cash at the moment, aren't they? True. To be, I mean, it's bigger than normal, I concede. And, and some people do put a bearish spin on that. And look, one of the greatest investors of the world has so much cash. It's his style. Partly he's become so big now, he's looking for a very, very large deal to do. And you mm. could argue his, his most significant large deal was simply buying huge amounts of Apple stock. And mm. by the way, here's a good example. Of a, Which he bought momentum. quite late, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, late. Yeah, but it's worked and it's worked out spectacularly over the last five or six years, even though conventionally it might have been considered late. But um, look, um, I would, I would, the press put more significance on this than, than, than they might. You know, he's... Um, mm. He's absolutely bullish on stocks in the long run, as we know, which is more yeah. my ethos. But he, you know, he needs big opportunities, and they're they're rather thin on the ground. Although it is interesting, he's put some money into Japan. Oh, okay, that's interesting. All right, then. Well, we might we might be coming back to Japan. I thought I'm sure we'll be talking about the Bank of Japan again at some time in the not too distant future. Okay, so that's a little bit of a catch up. What are the three things we need to know this week, Alan? So I think um, we should have a look at um, so-called contrarian indicators. There's a wide yep. range of them. And what they're saying right now, uh, spoiler alert, they're saying bye. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and you know why they work, they kind of have a bit of a, yeah. uh, you know, a little bit of a, I think why they may work. So, so that. Secondly, um, as you mentioned, we read the research and the newspapers. Not everyone reads the FT even these days, but Toby Nangle, who I know very well, who's who's now, I, th I think, retired, uh, wrote a great article in the FT, kind of contradicting what I said in a way, saying um, active management does weigh and what does work rather under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. So I've had a really good look at the report, the main report he's indicated, and I have some issues, um, but we'll go through okay. that. And then finally, it's all over the press as well. It's in The Economist this week. It's been in multiple articles in the FT. The government debt pile. Yes. What's our take on it? And uh, it, it mm. wouldn't be a weekly podcast with a bit of a rant from me. I'm going to have another rant about the size of the UK index link market and yes. why that's co you know costing us as taxpayers so much money, which no one seems yeah. to be accountable for. And a reminder of why we even do it, why we issue this um, inf right. these inflation link bonds. Yeah. OK, then. well, let's kick off then with contrarian indicators. What are they? What are we seeing at the moment? Do they actually work? Three questions in one there. Yeah. So most people kind of get it now, kind of get the idea that when everyone is bearish, you should be buying. And, uh, you know, Warren Buffett certainly comes to in, into, into that category as an investor and i just thought i'd look at three kind of indicators one that's been around forever which is the american association of individual investors i, I think it's been around 40 or 50 years basically they do a weekly survey are you bullish bearish or neutral so there's good data to work from there's that the second indicator is something called skew skewered mm -hmm. which is comes from the options market and the third indicator there's okay. many banks that do this I'll, I'll look at the bank of america or merrill lynch bull bear indicator but there are others so those are the three um but um what do you think sarah does, does it make sense to you that you know that negative sentiment is good or or, or should you be a momentum investor into this negative sentiment well oh, okay that, that's a, that's a good point i guess because we've talked a lot about peak pessimism and you get to a point where you probably need to sort of lean away from that peak pessimism and perhaps preempt the momentum by saying, 
okay, actually now is a good opportunity to go into markets. Everybody else thinks it's it's bad. We've probably got as bad as we can get. And now is the time to actually look forward and be a little bit more bullish. Uh, I guess it's that, I mean, I think, are they are the two completely incompatible momentum trading and, and being sort of contrarian? They are at extreme. And when everybody so, else so, is bearish, being a bull? Yeah. Yeah, they are at extreme. So the way to look at it, I suppose, is that if you have, if you had an early indication that people are getting bearish, for example, then you should sell, use momentum. But yeah. exactly as you said, when there's peak pessimism, so I'll just run through it. So the American Association of Individual Investors is showing right now uh, a majority towards a bearish stance. To be fair, it's it, with the rise in the market, it has ticked up a bit, but it was actually showing. So these are individual saying yes i'm bearish now it's what they're saying rather than how they're investing but when you look at that mm. as extremes and it got to relatively extreme earlier this year then absolutely a buy signal so that's number one number two is something called skew and that's really from the option market so we talked before about michael burry and buying all these put options from it the did. big short Well, if someone like him does that a lot, it pushes up the prices of put options. Mm. Because without getting too technical, in theory, put options and call options, they're both the play and volatility, should have relatively similar prices. Now, Mm. now because big falls in market are more common than big rises, you should pay a little bit more for put options, a little bit more. But actually, ever since the financial crisis put options become more and more expensive. And when so-called skew becomes extreme, and it did get extreme about a month ago, and it's still pretty high, I, the mm. Michael Burries of this world are, I'm not saying it's him, of this world, are, are buying huge amount of put options. Again, it shows, if you like, it's in the price. And it's too late because the market doesn't typically move to reward the, the, are we the majority. Are talking about the difference in... Are we talking about the difference in price between the put option and the call option then? Is it the wider the difference in price, the greater the skew? Yeah, yeah. So, so if, I, if, I, if, I, if I give you an intu- in intuition behind it. In simple terms, um, you, f- for an equivalent call option, you might want to pay 2%. For equivalent put option, you might want to pay 2.2, 2.3%. Um, right, you know, whereas when it gets skewed, the call option costs 2%. Of of, mm. what, of whatever you're looking to protect, and a put option may cost three percent. These are just right. you know ex- ex- exaggerated uh, yeah. you know, examples of how it works, but that's the intuition behind skew, and we can measure that, and it's available on the Bloomberg terminal terminal, for example, skew. So I like skew, and then the final one before we put it all together, and there's various firms that do that do this. Um, Bank of America do it well because they're very strong on flows. They have a bull bear indicator and they take into account both sentiment. Um, they, they, they put that, put that, they have them there. They, they also have they, their Merrill Lynch survey. So cash holdings they put in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then finally flows going back to pessimism. If there's a lot of outflows and right now, as it stands, a strong buy indicator and they have data. Uh, it's worth looking at the data. On a, it doesn't work every time, just like any signal, right? It doesn't work every time. Yeah. But over three months, so this is a relatively short-term indicator. But over three months, the median return is, is basically about 8%. This is from uh, global stocks. So you earn 8% yeah. when everyone is pessimistic as a median. There are times when you lose money, so nothing is perfect. So I think yeah. there's pretty strong evidence that... Well, if we bring it to life for now, pretty strong evidence that, yeah, uh, plus seasonality. We haven't even talked about seasonality for 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 ages. A good seasonal time to be in the markets. You should be mm, in equities yeah. for the next three months. Because we not might advice. get a Santa rally, mightn't we? Yeah, not, <laughs> not advice, but advice. A strong disclaimer but we, at the end. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so what we're saying at the moment then, so is it fair to, I, I, I'm going to ask you, but I know you're not going to be able to give me the answer. What percentage of the time do contrarian indicators prove to be right? Do these kind of very bearish, very sort of peak pessimism sort of mood in the markets, do they then prove to be good buying opportunities? 
So, for Can example, we put a number I've, to that? Yeah, I've got the Merrill Lynch one in front of me um, since 02 to 22, and it looks like um, next week I'll put hard maths on this. I probably should have done this before. And it looks like there's been 20 occurrences when it's uh, when the indicator is down here, so be- so bearish. And it looks like mm. about 14 out of 20 are strong positive median return at 8.6. So 14 out of 20, um, you get a very strong positive return. And 6 out of 20, either a very modest negative return. And there's one or two... There's, there's one or two more substantial negative returns. So it's a pretty okay. good indicator, but it just goes to show that's the nature of investment. We'd like it to be 17 or 18 out of 20. But if it was mm. that easy, then everyone would be doing it. So the, 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 yeah. with all these indicators, a little bit of judgment is needed as well. Okay. So essentially what we're saying is we, we've looked at two or three examples of contrarian indicators and what they're t- telling us and what they and they often we're not saying they're always right but they're often right is that that sort of sense of the very bearish peak pessimism is often a buy indicator correct sarah okay fine all right then so that's contrarian indicators moving on then to revisiting the subject of asset active versus passive and we both read the article by toby nangle and the ft and i think you went then and read the research as well Thoughts then. So he's basically saying that actually there is still a market for active managers, but for particular types of clients. That that was my sort of take from the article. Yeah. So um, I, uh, you know, last week, and um, you can you could obviously people can listen to that. I talked about the history, and the history I lent on is the Spiva research done by S&P, which shows, for example, over five years, when you account for survivor bias, 85% of managers underperform in US equities. Um, So so that's what I lent on. Now, I did also go on to to make a bold call that active is going to come back for various reasons. We won't revisit that. So where Toby and I agree, there's a future for active. I guess, strangely, uh, which shows how complex our industry is, where we disagree, and I would like to get him on, and I will be sending him this uh, podcast, is the history. So okay. um, be- before we, be- I was going to yeah. say, before we get to the history, can you just explain, because I think I know what you mean by survivorship bias or survivor bias. What do you mean in the context of sort of asset management and active managers? So what I mean by that, to put it in simple terms, if we, I'm just picking on US equities, but if we if we pick on the US equity mandates, that are available today, let's call them funds today, the US equity funds in particular that are available yeah. today, okay, and measure their performance, there's going to be some very good ones in there and not many that are terribly poor. Why? The ones that are, have been terribly poor historically, they they don't get client assets, uh, yeah. clients basically sell out of them and eventually they become in, uneconomic and they get closed or more typically they get merged away. So therefore, Mm. to have a true comparison of active versus passive, you have to go back in time and look for the closed funds as well and incorporate their data because they are they're also part of the equation. So and that's what S&P do in their research. And to be fair to Toby, um, CEM, um, have I got it with me? Um, It's in my uh, what does it stand for? Uh, you can tell this is not scripted. Um, so SEM benchmarking actually doesn't say it stands for anything, but I've got, I've, as you say, I've got the research here. I think it's uh, the, the title they, they they went for, SEM benchmarking. Um, they also do it, take into, because they look at real portfolios, starting with huge Canadian pension funds and others. Mm. And what they're looking at, institutional investors, and they do account for survivor bias because obviously, if, for example, a Canadian pension plan allocated to a poor global equity manager, which subsequently stopped doing global equities, that's in their numbers. So, um, yeah, yeah it, it shows somewhat different numbers, but um, I'm willing to take on Toby. And Toby's a fantastic ex fund manager and analyst. So I, I do this with all mm. humility and trepidation. Um, but anyway, sh- should we go through the numbers? Yes, do. Go on. Tell me. So basically, it shows after fees, 
when you strip out private assets, which is another big aspect because these large institutions. So this is institutional mandates, I should step back. So not the universe of funds. Mm. And um, what they find is that when you strip out private equity and private debt, private assets, in fact, that active management is worth 15 basis points per year net of cost. But it's positive. So 15 doesn't sound very much, does it, Sarah? It doesn't sound. And also you say, you're saying net of cost, right? Okay. But so net of cost. cost so, 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 so still, okay. you know, and bear in mind, uh, although there is some passive available for zero, passive does cost a couple of basis points. So it's not a bad mm. result. But this is the issue I have. Well, a couple of issues. Um, where I completely agree with him, low fees absolutely work. So these very large institutional yeah. investors, and we're part of that also at Coots, can negotiate much lower fees. So that's mm. you know absolutely, absolutely true. But what the research I've read it, and you know maybe we'll we'll have uh, Toby on, and he can he can maybe contradict me. But as far as I can say, it's not clear. It's pure fund selection because those that fifteen basis points, for example, could come from asset allocation. As far as I can see, fund selection. So what we're really trying to identify here, and even little things like the rebalance. When you rebalance a portfolio, there's a little bit of excess return from rebalance, especially on a risk-adjusted basis. But the other area is slightly more esoteric asset classes adding to performance. So these could be things such as loan funds, asset-backed securities. Mm. These are more in the debt space, admittedly. Um, and then you've got um, kind of funds like, not privates, but merger arbitrage, mer merger arbitrage, convertible arbitrage. So there's all kinds of asset classes that could be in there which help explain the, the 15 basis points. So okay. I just find the SPIVA data. So I'm going to send him this, send him the SPIVA date, and, and it's just so much purer. Admittedly, it's funds, and I agree there's a there's big fees in there, but the SPIVA mm -hmm. data compares a US equity mutual fund versus an index, a global equity mutual fund versus an index, et cetera, et cetera. I find it much more pure but um, so I kind of stand by that it's been a really, my previous comment, that it's been really, really mm. tough for active managers. I do concede that, one, lower fees, and two, maybe if you have some real expertise in fund selection, you can, you, 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 yeah. even though it's been tough historically, you can find some managers, and maybe that's what this research is hinting at, but it's been so difficult. Where I suppose with things we agree is that the future is somewhat brighter. And you're talking to someone who's been a big advocate for passive investing mm. um, yeah. for many years. But, so, go on. Yeah, I was going to say, so he's, but he's essentially arguing the case for active managers, but he's focusing really on for the institutional investors, isn't he? He's not really saying they're great for retail investors because the costs, if you're a retail investor, you're you're kind of eating into those returns, but he's saying for institutional investors, where the costs are less of an issue, there is a really strong case still for active management. Is that is that essentially what he's saying? That's what he's saying. I take issue with that historically because I think that fifteen basis points. It it is the, the report doesn't prove it's come from fund selection, and so for right. example, if I put it really simply, just a a modest overweight in U.S. equities. <laughs> would explain all of that 15 basis points easily, for example. So look, I concede that where I think he's absolutely onto something, low fees work, absolutely. Low fees are associated with, with better prospects for alpha. Um, I am I need some persuading on the research and I really hope we can get him on, but let's see. But um, uh, so yeah, we st stand by our original research we stand by the Spiva research, yeah. if you like. Okay. Well, there's an open invitation, Toby Nangle. You're very welcome to come on Need to Know. I'd like to uh, – it'll be another podcast where I won't get a word in edgeways, but it'll be fascinating to hear you two arguing about active versus passive. All right, then. Okay, so that's that. And then the last one, then, again, it's another piece. We both read pieces in the FT about this. Um, debt levels, um, perhaps getting – kind of alarmingly high with especially as 
you know, we're going to perhaps, we're seeing sort of quantitative tightening rather than quantitative easing. And we've got the, all this debt issuance, um, perhaps possibly the rise of bond vigilantes again. So thought, thoughts on what, what prompted you to want to talk about this? Well, it's all over the press. I've got today's, today's this week's Economist, Treasury issu- issuance, a whole article about Treasury issuance. And um, yeah, and it, it, it's not just the US, it, you know, there's debt issues including here at home in the UK, you know, the one place where there's, there isn't any debt issues? Ireland. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, why is that? Why is that then? They have budget surpluses. Is that because they've got very low um, corporation tax and things like that, and they make it very well, attractive for sort of inward investment? Yeah, well, as we say, Sarah, um, nearly everything that we do in economics and finance is theories. We don't know for sure. <laughs> But I would argue incentives work, and Ireland is mm. a good example. But let's you know put that to to one side. So mm. yeah, um, and but this is the this is the strange issue. We get a computer, Sarah. We we plug mm. in deficits and issuance versus direction of bonds. Do you make or lose money? Amazingly, the computer well, will say big deficits. You're going to make a lot yeah, of money. Good for bonds. Good okay, for bonds. Yeah. Why? Mm. Because historically, big deficits have been associated with recessions, interest rates collapsing, mm. and yeah. that is the, the that is the force that has driven bonds to positive returns more than the supply. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants bonds then when interest rates are going down rapidly. Yeah, the issue we I have is the United... bus coming, Alan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dare I say I'm going to say the most dangerous words in finance? This time is different, uh, mm, and, okay. and um, I'd be delighted if I proved wrong. Because we have these huge deficits when the US economy is strong, approaching a, yes. a deficit of 8% coming up because the US is spending mm. so much money. And yeah. it's somewhat worrying, you know. So, so, so the UK deficit is about 4%, by the way. Um, so we're, mm. we're not on this expansionary path that the US mm. is on. And for example, 30% of the US market has to be completely refinanced next year. Now, yes, if we're in recession and rates have been cut, no problem. But if the U.S. economy remains relatively robust, quite simply, supply demand in this environment. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would be cautious, and and um, I would be still seeing bonds as you know a really attractive place for earning income, but maybe yes. not yet for the big capital gains. The supply is just so huge. And um, it's a problem. And we have we have a problem in the UK uh, less on. Um, and this is a bit of a rant. I think I have ranted about this before. Less yeah. about supply. I mean, don't get me wrong. UK supply is large, but um, interest payments are now four and a half percent of GDP driven by inflation linked bonds. We have, yeah. Sarah, in this country, so much more in inflation linked bonds compared to the rest of the world. And no one's accountable for it. What, why Why is that? I know you've mentioned this before, but remind me, why is it that we have, I think I saw a figure of something like 25% of, our, of of the debt that we issue is inflation-linked, is in inflation-linked yeah. bonds. And other countries, so US, et cetera, is, is about seven, eight, you know, much, much mm. lower. Um, good question. You know, it is a really good question because- um, You've got an answer though, so, haven't you? This is not a theory. Uh, no, no, yeah. Well, they issued it. Well, mm. the argument was um, pension funds love inflation-linked debt, okay, because mm. their liabilities have inflation in them, wages essentially, and sometimes formally inflation. So we're selling to a willing buyer, but so do U.S. pension plans. So do Dutch pension plans, but mm. they haven't gone crazy for inflation-linked debt. Um, you know, there's other investments such as infrastructure, real estate, which are more inflation, which are also inflation, have inflation sensitivity. So um, what it means, of course, is that we have an outsized interest rate bill because of this, you know, big increase in inflation that we're experiencing here in the UK. And it's interesting because no one, apart from you and me, Sarah, no one seems to talk about it. It's too obscure, and certainly, usually, yeah. we're really good at blaming people. Um, I don't like to particularly because it's easy in hindsight, 
But it is a bit unusual the UK to have such a large inflation-linked market compared to the rest of the world and to be costing us such a lot of money. Mm. And no one seems to, you know, say anything about it. But in well, my I mind, we've got to last... stop it. I was going to say, it's well, only in the last couple of years that it's really become an issue, hasn't it? True, but one way of thinking about it is that for many years, you've had basically equal type payments where, mm. uh, if you like, nominal gilts, if you, if you go back many years, what you know, when gilts, I know gilts yield circa 5% now, but gilts pay, conventional gilts pay 5 inflation-linked gilts used to pay 2 to 3 for many, many years. So what was the point? Okay. Mm. Well, the point is for pension funds, they're making out really well right now. Whereas us as taxpayers are, are paying heavily because now, of course, with inflation, which has had a 10 handle and a lot of it indexed to retail price inflation, um, it's, you know, it's been a horrendous cost to the treasury um, and, and, to the, and to the government. So, yeah, I, I, I just think... Not enough, not, not enough work has gone into really, do we need this scale of inflation-linked debt compared to other countries? Mm. But anyway, rant over. Um, <laughs> hindsight is easy. Those of you who, yeah. you know, who did make this decision, I get it. You know, the pension funds were clamoring for it. You know, you know maybe if I was involved, I'd say, yeah, why not pension funds have it? But I, I just wonder, because usually I'm surprised, I guess, Someone didn't say, hold on a minute, our debt is 25, it was once 30%, whereas mm. US is 7, 8, France is 5 or something. You, you know, let, let's have a look. Yeah. Other, other pension sort of managers can, can, can do without it. Why can't UK pension funds do without it? Is that's, there a political kind of appetite like, yeah. then to reduce that that level of sort of inflation linked bonds do you think because is it a political decision or is it something that has to come from the central banks no it's it's a debt management office it's yeah it's it's the government that issue mm. debt it's for it's for it's for governments ultimately um yeah i think it's one of these things that just slipped through over time mm. um and and look um to be fair, did I see this huge surge in inflation? No, not necessarily. I, I did have another yeah. rant about crazy zero rates when uh, the economy was booming, but I, you know I didn't see it either. So look, it's easy. I, I don't want to be Mister Hindsight here, but um, still, let let's see um, let's see if if we get any focus on this going forward. I mean, I've seen the odd reference yeah. to it in the press, but no one's really dig deep about it. But anyway. That's enough ranting. We don't want to be. We don't want to end on a negative point. And, and no, we don't want to. We should talk about the future. We're going to get um, Howard's colleague on, on in a couple of weeks, aren't we, to talk about earnings we elsewhere? Are, we are. Yeah, we're going to get Richard Wade coming on short soon to talk about UK earnings season, and I know he's got some thoughts on Santa rallies as well. So I think we'll probably be talking about that as as the end of the year approaches rapidly. And you're also going to be thinking about your three surprises and we're going to try and get some other colleagues in the bank lined up for that as well well thank you very much alan for joining me this week on need to know a reminder that the views expressed in this podcast are not intended to constitute investment advice are accurate at the time of recording and are subject to change don't forget to check out the podcast page on coots.com and of course if you're already a subscriber to put need to know fantastic please leave reviews on whichever platform you normally use to access your podcasts. Um, that's all for this week. Until next time on Need to Know, bye for now.